So hello, everybody. Welcome to our event. Um, overview of a classical image analysis workflow for tissue classification. This is um, part one of a three part event called from tissue classification to proximity measurement with um, an overarching goal um, where we will look at um, how AI software uh, works based on some practical use cases and where we will shed some light on um, what different types of AI models to use um, for what types of research questions. So that will be what we will be exploring in this three-part event. Um, to let everybody come in slowly, I will start by giving you some um, quick explanations on our house rules for this event. So this is very simple. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you will see that uh, there is a Q&A box in which you can post your questions at any time during this uh, presentation. And we will save some time at the end to answer your questions live with our speakers today. So feel free to use that option. Otherwise, everybody's muted uh, because we you know, quite um, a lot of people today joining us. So then, um, you know, um, this will allow for um, a good flow into the presentation. Right, so my name is uh, Anne-France Carter. I work at Pressy Point uh, in uh, the marketing team as a content uh, manager. And um, I would now like to introduce our speakers. Um, so I will start with uh, my colleague, Birgit Müller, who um, is here at Prissy Point, head of the business development. Welcome, Birgit. Hello. And then uh, let me introduce um, Alex stickler bereng from uh, Tissue Agnostics, who um, is uh, very kindly accepted to um, talk about um, AI for image analysis. And uh, Alex is um, International Sales and Business uh, Development Manager. Hello. Right. So um, I'm really, really pleased to have both of them as they will walk us through um, a, a classical image analysis workflow and imaging workflow starting from the um, digitization of the slides all the way through to the analysis. And then we will look at different analysis scenarios um, throughout the three events. So here's the agenda for today. As I said, we start with uh, slide digitization, then move on to um, the analysis of this very slide um, and um, more details, as you will see, and then uh, jump into the Q&A session. Good, so um, now I'm actually um, giving Alex the stage, sorry, my mistake, Birgit is starting. I'm giving Birgit the stage um, to start the uh, presentation. Thank you, Anne-France. You're welcome. Let's look into uh, our side of the presentation. And uh, that is how you're actually generating an image that you can afterwards analyze in a good way. And uh, I think, Anne-France, I actually had a few slides before the demo, right? Yes, if you can go to the next one, maybe. Exactly. So what it is that Pressy Point is producing for all of those that, that are not familiar with what it is that we are doing, um, we are first and foremost a producer of microscopes and, and scanners, digital microscope and scanners um, that are fully automated. Um, we're also producing the microscopy software with it, uh, so that's the software that is basically the operating system for the digital scanners. And then we also have image management systems and viewers where you can then view images and share them in, in, in a very easy way. And uh, we're also doing some digitization consulting on how to you know, put a, a digital device, include a digital device into your workflow 
in order to really work smoothly with it and uh, reap all the digital benefits that you can have. Yes, and uh, now I would like to give you a live demo. So for that, I am sharing my screen. And what I will show you is, um, I hope you can see that by now, is uh, the user interface of our slide, digital slide scanner. Uh, we have two different kinds of modes that are the main modes in which you can use the scanner. You can scan. Of course, that's the mode in which you can actually create a digital file with which you can then use the software that Alex, for example, is showing afterwards. Um, but then you also have a live mode and uh, the live mode is called instant scan. And it basically allows you to, in a live way, look at a sample. Now, why is this interesting? When you're looking into uh, a sample, and you want to analyze this sample with an AI. You, of course, only want to put the sample into the AI that you know, I mean, firstly has on the sample what it should have. When you want to sell some kind of nuclei, uh, count some kind of nuclei, you need to see the nuclei on the sample. Um, it should, of course, have a staining that is correct, you know, not over or under stain that might give trouble for the AI. Um, and uh, it should also be, you know, cut in a way that you can actually achieve a good scan from if the cut is very, very uneven, it will be extremely hard to create a good scan based on which the AI can then work. So what we have is this, this live mode that allows you to, before you do a scan, very quickly gain an overview of your sample. So you can start basically from very far outside and note this is a live image. So I haven't scanned this before. It's basically showing you how the sample looks like. And then it allows you to scroll in and out and check the sample for its... Uh, you know, for whether it is on, what is on, is the staining, what you thought it would be, is it a good sample? And there you can see already that the device, maybe you hear it a bit in the background as well, that the device is working. And the interesting thing in this mode is as well that you can refocus. I mean, a lot of samples are not going to be as plain as the Netherlands, but uh, might rather be Switzerland. Uh, in terms of a topography. So it allows you to press autofocus quickly and, and refocus. If that mode doesn't work, you can even go into a manual mode where you see the fine drive that you know from an analog microscope, and then you can try to get the, the right level of focus and see whatever it is that you actually would like to have in a focus, right? And then click back, and then it takes this plane into focus and works with that and it allows you to get this very quick overview it might also be that you're saying only a part of the entire slide is actually interesting for scanning i think alex is going to show that you know for some tissue classification it, not all of the parts are relevant so if we would assume it's only this part in the middle here that is actually relevant and you only want to analyze this, you don't need to scan the entire slide. Um, so from this mode, you can go to export to slide and it brings us to the scanning mode where you can then see that it shows me this little bar in the middle. Let me show that a little bit bigger. Uh, it shows you this little bar in the middle uh, or a rectangle in the middle, which is the, the area that I have chosen before in the other mode. And now I could go scan that and only this, which would allow you to both be a lot faster in the scanning. And then of course, at the same time, use less space because as you probably know, uh, WSI, so a, a full scan of a full slide is a, quite, uh, is a quite big file in a lot of cases, especially once you go into the higher magnifications. So doing it like this is definitely a way that allows you to be faster and, and you know, work smarter um, in, in this kind of area. Then in terms of the scanning, just a brief tip what's important as well, also when you want to work with AI, 
um, is ensure that you place the sample in the middle of the slide. I mean, it doesn't have to be very much in the middle, but usually most scanners have limitations towards the very outside. Also ensure that it doesn't, that, that it is fully covered by the cover slip. So don't have it, you know, go partly into here um, because of course the cover slip create some kind of a visual artifact that the AI also needs to kind of overcome as a hurdle. And uh, yeah, I think this is this is pretty much the tips that I can give so far in how to to work, you know, in the smartest way with a, with a slide scanner and with our scanner so that you can get optimal results for using it with analysis software afterwards. With that, I will stop my screen share. And then I think we have two more slides on false for me, right? Perfect. So just to give you a very brief overview of what it is that we actually have for scanning or what you could scan with our devices. We have uh, three basic devices, the M8, the O8, and the Fritz. And uh, the M8 is uh, scanning histology, histological slides and cytological slides. And the O8 then is for hematology slides. So that can also scan with uh, oil immersion, whereas the M8 and the Fritz, they are the two that scan with the uh, air immersion objectives only. And then you have the two modes of the scanning mode and this live microscopy mode that I just showed you. And then as I said, uh, we also have a, a slide viewer. Um, so of course, when you created an image, you want to look at it. I mean, of course, this is, <laughs> this is what you do it for, right? And you would like a viewer that is called Prezi Cloud, that is uh, browser-based, which allows you to share the images via a hyperlink, which makes it very, very easy to actually share it with colleagues, you know, for a second opinion or just look into it. Is this the right thing? Am I interpreting it in the right way? Um, in order to be able to do your analyses and do your, do your research work or, or work with it, right? Um, and it allows you to do the exact same thing as you can do with any other slide that you have scanned. You can zoom in, you can do annotations soon. And uh, what we will integrate soon into the cloud as well is uh, being able to do some analysis in there already. Yes. And that now is really my part. And with that, I think I'm handing over to Alex. Thank you, Birgit. Thank All right, you. thank you. Alex, um, sure. Now you can take over. Okie dokie. Oh, give me one second. Okay. Yes, I hope you see my screen. Yes, all good. Okay, cool. So, um, where is the other side? Sorry, just one second. Alrighty, so um, thank you for that introduction and for the uh, and for that demo. Um, uh, right, so in this webinar, we're going to be, or at least for for this part of the webinar, we're going to be focusing on an overview of uh, uh, of AI. It seems like it's a, a nebulous. Um, term that's been thrown around like crazy these last years and it's getting in more and more intense uh, every year it seems and it is really um, and so we're going to focus on uh, AI in particular in histopathology and the way we use uh, this so many of us have already heard of artificial intelligence from pop culture or Hollywood movies um, and uh, these are mostly gross overestimations of uh, uh, or doomsday scenarios. And although AI can, in some cases, be or become uh, a controversial tool, um, we are here to discuss it in the context of histopathology, 
where these tools exist primarily to lessen your workload uh, and increase accuracy of your analysis and also generally improve lives. Um, so what is artificial intelligence? And this is uh, a, a broad definition here is a wide, ra wide ranging branch of computer science concerned with building smart machines capable of mimicking problem solving and decision making of the human mind. And so machine learning and, uh, and so where do machine learning and deep learning fall within the category of artificial intelligence. And so here's a little uh, breakdown of what that looks like. So you can see mach uh, machine learning and deep learning are a part of artificial intelligence, but machine learning is a subset of AI specializing in self-learning algorithms, which can extract knowledge from data to make accurate predictions. And deep learning is a further subset within machine learning, which leverages multiple layers of artificial neural networks for automated learning and automatic feature detection or feature extraction. Um, and so we're going to be focusing on deep learning applications in the next session. Uh, and in this session, we'll mostly be looking at machine learning applications. But still, I, I'd still like to define this a little bit further. So the purpose of this slide here is to illustrate uh, the types of applications that are made possible by machine learning and the difference between machine learning and deep learning models. Um, so the major difference down here is, um, is the way information is extracted from data. And with machine learning models, uh, the features we're most interested in must be handcrafted or hand annotated uh, for extraction. So a model can be created. And for deep learning models, an artificial neural network is given classified data uh, and the, neur the neural network then automatically identifies uh, the features that make each class unique. Uh, and so that's the major difference here is that machine learning, uh, uh, sorry, deep learning models automatically extract features from classified data. And that kind of also makes them into somewhat of a black box. The, the artificial neural networks are very complex. Um, and so it can sometimes be very tough to, uh, to identify why an, uh, a deep learning model identifies things incorrectly or correctly. Uh, and what happens then when you change the data? Uh, and yeah, so there, there are some, some funny anecdotes that my colleagues have given me um, where uh, MRI uh, images are, are given into a, a deep learning algorithm. And uh, I'm not sure if I'm butchering the story or not, but <laughs> I hope not. Um, there are two classes of data. And uh, in, the, in the testing phase, the algorithm did a really great job of segmenting or at least automatically classifying those two types of data. And then later on, when they introduced data from outside of that testing source or a data from other MRI machines, they realized that the deep learning algorithm was identifying the text at the top right corner of each image that said diseased or not diseased. So it, it, it noticed the differences in, in text rather than the features of the image. So you don't really know what the ordinary artificial neural network will look for, but uh, it'll take, it'll use anything uh, uh, to find differences between images. Anyways, so um, some examples here at the top right uh, of uh, applications in machine learning include the classification of images, for example. Uh, this, is a para this is an image that contains a parathyroid gland. And uh, if we had a ton of these images, some of which contain parathyroid glands and some of which do not, uh, a classification uh, would mean that images are classified as either contain parathyroid or do not contain parathyroid. And you have two classes. Um, and then we also have um, uh, detections of objects. So is there a parathyroid gland? Yes. And then detect the parathyroid gland. And so this is what, what, uh, what it would look like. Um, a bounding box would appear around an object of interest. Uh, and then we have two different types of segmentation. Segmentation here means that um, an object within that bounding box will then be um, segmented from the rest of the image and the borders of those objects would be delineated by an algorithm, uh, um, uh, machine learning or deep learning. And so semantic in this case means that all objects of, uh, of one type are going to be uh, segmented. And instance segmentation is that each one of those in, uh, individual objects would be uh, segmented as its own individual object that can be counted and measured. So, uh, 
a little breakdown of what a workflow would look like is um, you would have raw data coming in. So images primarily, at, at least in this, in this case, there would be images. Um, you would have a pre-processing step uh, optional. You can uh, use uh, certain types of algorithms to blur an image or, or color separate them um, uh, for more easy, uh, an easier detection uh, using um, machine learning or conventional methods even. This is something we commonly do uh, with our image analysis software, StratoQuest. And um, you would choose one of these methods or all three of the methods, which is something we'll be going into in the next, uh, uh, in this webinar and in the next two. And then we have a post-processing and evaluation step in the end. Um, practically, this would look something like this. Uh, this is what the algorithm would do in the background, basically. Um, for, so for histopathology, uh, we can utilize all those methods of machine learning to identify objects of interest and measure them. And so this is a, an H&E &E, &E stained liver biopsy, which was given the classification task of identifying if the image is either healthy or diseased. And in order to make this decision, an algorithm needs to incorporate object detection, semantics uh, segmentation, and individual segmentation to identify those objects. So in here, you can see we have these nuclei that are um, detected with bounding boxes, and then the algorithm can then look within those bounding boxes and delineate the borders uh, of each of that uh, each of those objects, and then uh, individually segment each one of those. So at this point, uh, I'd like to mention that we use machine learning primarily for tissue classification, and uh, we're using the term classification here to classify different types or classes of tissue within an image, uh, not one image uh, as a whole. I mean, you could do that later, but in this case, we're using machine learning for tissue classification, meaning, um, and this, this is, an, uh, this is a, an IHC staining of a colon section with Ki67 and hematoxylin. And so um, I'm just gonna use this as an example uh, in a practical in a practical example in the software. I hope I'm not running out of time. Um, right, so I'm going to use this example to segment tissue from non-tissue. Super, super simple. Um, uh, later on, we'll get more in, uh, into some more complex tasks with more categories. Um, but a machine learning algorithm uh, like ours in this case would um, take all the pixels available in this image. This image, of course, is con contains tons and tons of pixels. I don't know how many, but um, every single pixel would be categorized, categorized into one of two categories, the ones I defined, tissue and non-tissue. And we use a, a, a machine learning algorithm called random forest for this task. And it, uh, it forces an algorithm to choose which category any given pixel falls into using what we call a decision tree. And this is a the underlying algorithm in our machine learning tissue classifier that will um, segment uh, each one of those pixels, or at least categorize each one of those pixels into its into the um, appropriate class. So at this point, I'm going to switch over to the analysis software StratoQuest. I hope this is the right window, and I hope you see. A different screen now. Okay. Yes, Thank we you. do. We do. Mm -hmm. Cool. <clears throat> Good. So this is StratoQuest. This is our uh, flagship image analysis software. Um, uh, the user interface here is, uh, I'm not going to get into too much detail about the user interface because I'm uh, bound by some time limits. My main focus here, again, is the classifier. Um, we have our main image here. It's the same image. Um, uh, uh, Ki67 uh, staining and a hematoxylin on the brown, uh, brown Ki67 hematoxylin is blue. And uh, this is a colon section. Um, and there's a lot more we can do here besides just detecting the tissue, obviously. This is just for demonstration purposes. Um, we have an algorithm on the left-hand side here. You have tons and tons of, uh, of operations just in the pre-processing phase. Um, you, this uh, StratoQuest works, the reason why we call it StratoQuest is that it, we work in layers and every single layer in StratoQuest is dedicated to one detection task. Uh, you can have multiple measurements that come in every layer, but we typically build upon uh, 
each layer of analysis. And the first thing we would maybe do is detect the tissue. After that, we can look into how many cells are, how many uh, nuclei are there? Um, are they positive on Ki67? Are they not? Uh, what are their intensities? Uh, maybe where are they? Are they located within these crypts? Are they in the stroma? These are all questions we can ask uh, and also um, uh, find using the software. But for now, um, I in the pre-processing phase, I'm just going to choose uh, the um, tissue classifier. And this is what it looks like down here. It's super simple. Um, this is a way for you to transfer your knowledge into a, uh, a machine learning model very, very quickly. Um, and so you have some buttons here for adding classes, subtracting classes, drawing, and creating models. You also have some extra uh, settings here you can play with, but I'm not going to get into those right now. And so what you were going to do is literally draw on the sample. And I've got a background class and a tissue class. When you click on them, you can change the color of the paintbrush or the thickness of the brush, um, fill shapes, and so on. And when you click on the plus, you can start drawing. And so when we do this, we have to be very conscious about which, uh, what the properties are of the pixels we're highlighting. And so this is maybe uh, you have to kind of change the way you think when you're looking at an image. An image consists of pixels of different colors and different intensities. Um, and textures, because we're looking at tissue. And there are very, very subtle differences between um, objects of interest, right? Depending on what classes you're choosing. Right now, it's pretty easy because we're check, uh, looking at background and tissue. But so what I would do typically is just highlight some pixels, some areas uh, directly on the image. Uh, and you can see there are some uh, even though this is background, there are some areas that have uh, some debris, right? And we want to make sure that the algorithm understands that those are also considered, also should be considered as background. We also want to make sure about where we're drawing, how close are we getting to the actual tissue? And this is important because a machine learning algorithm will not just look at the paintbrush strokes, but also surrounding pixels around each of these strokes. And so if we're very close to the tissue, we want to make sure that we're as close to it as possible without actually touching it. And um, so every brush stroke matters here. And we'll go through multiple uh, instances very quickly here. So I've got given it some information about what the background looks like. I'm going to say save that. And now I'm going to move to the tissue class, start drawing. And so you can already tell. Uh, maybe that there are some parts of the tissue that actually look very similar to the background. We have uh, holes here in these crypts. Um, these should be, in my opinion, for this uh, video, we'll say those are considered uh, tissue areas. We also have very bright or very light uh, textures here with not a lot going on. We could call those low density areas in the crypts that are also considered tissue. We have these epithelial cells uh, in the crypts. Whoops, that's a little ugly there so that should also be considered tissue um, and um, of course we also have these brown cells uh, brown stained ks67 positive cells within the epithelium we want to make sure that those are also counted and so we want to give it as much information as possible without uh, selecting any background here or any class that's outside of this and because we're using tissue it's very broad um, but we also want to give it information about very light areas within the stroma, because there are some areas there as well that should be considered as tissue area. And I'm going to give it a little more information here, because I see there are some very, very dark brown cells in the stroma that I wanted to, to recognize, and maybe a little bit more of this uh, uh, center of that, of, that, uh, of that lumen there. Uh, we also have some area here. Just give it that. And so I'll click on yes and uh, start training. So now it's going to create a model. This is just one image, and it's going to be really, really fast. It's already finished. And I'm going to click on Analyze up here. And so it's finished now. And uh, I can check out the results here by clicking on this uh, this tab. And so you can see it's already done a really great job of classifying tissue versus non-tissue areas. Um, so you can imagine what this might be like on a sample that's a little more complex. But uh, 
with the more classes you have, the more particular and conscious you have to be about your brush strokes. And so I'm gonna show you another sample, in particular, the sample that Birgit just scanned. And so this one is a little bit more complex. Uh, again, we're still using Strata Quests. It all looks the same, except we have more classes in this classifier. We have the background again. We have the growth plate, calcified bone, bone marrow, muscle, and an other class, which uh, is tissue that I was not able to uh, define or classify because it might be connective tissue or skin or something that I, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not a biologist. Or, <laughs> so it's uh, difficult for me to even do that. So I, what I did here was I will, uh, I have, I've already um, created a region of interest around the classifiable areas in this rat paw. Uh, everything else here is just too uh, messy. I have no clue uh, what all this stuff is. I know this is a claw, but uh, I would need uh, to consult um, somebody who specializes in this type of tissue in order to get a classification for those areas. But so that's why I've just selected this area here. So what I want to show you before I show you the results is just how uh, particular I was about selecting these areas uh, for where I, where I basically drew um, uh, my annotations. So these are all my annotations here on the bottom. Um, you can see if I double click on any one of those where I've where I annotated. And so for the background, I selected areas that were very, very near the tissue and a little bit further away for the growth plate. Um, I selected areas that were um, very near the, um, the, the bone marrow in red. We have uh, calcified bone here in blue, which was probably the trickiest um, structure here to detect accurately because there are so many different shades of blue. Every shade really matters uh, for, a, for a machine learning algorithm. And so you have to be very conscious about what you're highlighting and maybe have uh, be methodical about it. So you uh, need to select maybe the uh, areas that are closest to other objects, like the other classes, like the bone marrow, and then ones that are further away, or maybe a little bit, uh, have a little bit of a, uh, a darker shade, but should still be considered as the growth plate. For calcified bone, I, uh, I made sure to give it a lot of information um, because I noticed that it was very particular about uh, the shade of blue that I was selecting. So I chose the very dark shades of blue and then lighter shades or shades that also even contain some, some red here. So you can see there are different shades of blue and, and the machine or learning algorithms really take that into consideration. And if you take a look at this there, uh, this part right here, it's like almost black uh, because it's overlapping with some red probably. And so uh, I did the same thing for each of these classes. And you can really see that with the red, uh, the red um, meaning uh, the bone marrow. And so if I just take a look at one of these areas of bone marrow, you can see that it is very dense uh, in, 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 in the color red uh, and how many cells there are. It's very densely packed. Um, but then again, you also have these, um, these very, very thin lines. It looks like fat or something like that. I'm not sure, it might be fat. Um, but uh, for the sake of this demonstration, we're considering all this as bone marrow. And so you have to be very particular with what uh, objects of interest you're highlighting. Um, that's basically the point I'm trying to make here. Uh, the other section is kind of anything that is like over here, this kind of stuff, I have no clue what it is. So I just selected it as other. And because a machine learning algorithm uh, at least uh, this type of machine learning algorithm for tissue classification will take all the pixels in the image and classify them. You have to give it as much information as possible. Uh, so good. So we can take a look at the results here. If we zoom all the way out, you get a nice bird's eye view of, uh, of the classification. And the amount of time I spent on this is, uh, I think, insignificant compared to the amount of information I get from this type of an image uh, and this type of a classification. And of course, it isn't perfect. Um, the more time you spent on it, uh, the, the, the closer you will get to 100%. Um, I cannot guarantee or promise anyone that you ever will hit 100%. Um, that is, uh, I don't even think it's 
<laughs> possible with a human being. Uh, people make mistakes, um, but you can you can the more time you spend on it, the the more cl the closer you will get to it. And I uh, I didn't really spend that much time uh, analyzing this. I mean, I was very particular about it because I wanted to to make sure that this is a, a good classification. But yeah, so it just goes to show how uh, how easy it can be to transfer your knowledge into a model for machine learning. And so you can see we've got these muscle. If I switch back and forth between this uh, these two overlays, you can really see uh, what it's done here. We've got these mu uh, muscle areas here, the growth plate highlighted. Uh, and the calcified bone in the green overlay, and we also have the bone marrow in red. And uh, the purple areas are undefined connective tissue of some sort. Good, so that's that example. And I have one last one, which I think is also really cool. So this is maybe a little bit more of a practical example. Um, I'm gonna show you two different, uh, Images. I hope you see a different a different screen now. Okay, cool. Um, you have um, we're now looking at breast cancer needle biopsies. Uh, let me just show you this. Okay, so um, here the question was uh, classification once again. Um, if we take a look and, and zoom into this, you can see uh, areas that have a high accumulations of immune cells here um, that we want to classify and detect. We also have tumor cells, uh, tumor areas here that we would like to uh, classify. We have fat areas of fat here in the bottom, and we have the stroma in uh, this light pink here. And so teaching a, uh, a machine learning tissue classifier how to do this is basically the same way we did it with the, the rat paw, except I have multiple samples this time. And that's the major difference. Um, this is a separate sample. It looks similar because the cut is, is very similar, um, but it is another one, a different sample, maybe from a different patient, or maybe from the same patient, I don't know. Um, but uh, this one really looks very different, but it's still breast cancer, it's still H&E. And I wanna create a model that is flexible enough to deal with uh, variation um, between different types of samples. Uh, and I want to be able to feed the algorithm uh, multiple samples rather than just to do uh, just do one classification for one sample. And so what I did was I created uh, what we call uh, a playground. And uh, that basically means I'm taking snapshots, uh, multiple snapshots from each sample or from multiple samples, and uh, I create the classifier model on this. And so if I open this uh, in a detail window, which I need to share once more uh, here. I hope you see a different one now, hopefully. Uh, if I show you the classifier, show you the drawings here. Yes, um, you can see the annotations that I've made. And so I made sure to uh, be as uh, as very uh, varied as possible in the snapshots that I chose. I wanted to find use some images that contain background, some images that contain the areas of high accumulations of immune cells, fat cells, uh, all the different classes. And some of some of these snapshots focus on one or the other or multiple, uh, and rarely all of them. But I wanted to be a little bit variable here with uh, with my annotations. And so what this gives me is a model that is flexible enough to deal with multiple types, uh, multiple samples of the same kind. And um, if I show you the, um, the results here, uh, let me go to this one, do a new share. Hopefully you see a different sample again. Cool. And check out all the classes. And so here we can see, if we zoom in a little bit more, the classification. And there might be some post-processing that we have to do here to clean this up. Uh, there are some areas here that are bordering on the tissue that the algorithm thinks are fat cells, which is incorrect. But um, after some post-processing or maybe some edge detection, we can uh, rule that out. But 
the major um, point of all this is that we have information we can measure. I have um, I have information on uh, the tumor area. So if I right click on this, I can see view event data, and I can see this entire area and the um, and how big it is. And so this is all in very valuable information that I might be able to make use of uh, in the future. So um, I can do that for any one of these uh, tissue classes. So this is the stroma. We have this huge area of, uh, oops, that's a tiny little uh, area of stroma there. So fat cells here, this is a huge area of fat. And, um, and this works on all the different samples I have, even the one, uh, even that other one, let me just share this one, uh, the, the longer needle biopsy. And so this is an algorithm that is a, a machine learning um, tissue classifier that is flexible enough to deal with uh, variation, which is, uh, I think, a more real world application here. And if I flip back and forth between those two, you can really see this segmentation. Uh, it's pretty good. So that is kind of uh, it. I think uh, those are all the samples I have for today. Uh, in the next session, I'm going to be focusing on deep learning and uh, uh, nuclei segmentation. And um, I think that'll be a pretty interesting session. Uh, but this was just an introduction basically to machine learning tissue classification, a really nice tool uh, and uh, just super easy to transfer your knowledge into an algorithm without needing to know uh, the basics or um, the intricacies of image analysis, or classical image analysis. So, yeah. Excellent, excellent. Um, thank you very much, Alex. That was really super interesting. Um, cool. Gave us Thank a you. really, really good overview of Glad tissue classification. So. Um, we have actually quite a lot of questions. Um, so let's go straight into them um, with our Q&A session. So I will invite okay. Birgit maybe to pick uh, some questions from the Q&A box. And I think we do have some, we may have some in the chat, but let's start with the Q&A ones. Yes, I will. I will start uh, and read out some of the questions. Um, Alex, I think most of the questions are for you, anyways. Uh, can you analyze TMAs? Yes, uh, TMAs can be automatically identified as individual um, regions, and uh, they can be individually analyzed as well. Yes. Um, so TMAs are actually what I'm going to be focusing on in the last session. It's going to be a really interesting session, uh, I think, because it combines uh, machine learning and deep learning and classical image analysis um, in, in TMA course. So it's going to be it's going to be pretty cool, I think. Very cool. Then um, the next question is, Alex, do you have a value of how much you actually save in efficiency uh, in a lab by using uh, an AI when you do digital pathology? Uh, let me see. How do I answer that question? Um, it depends. I think <laughs> the crappy answer, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I think uh, I can also try and uh, give an answer from, from my side. I think, yeah, it depends. Is definitely a good question, a good answer. Um, what I think makes difference is, is, of course, we do see that the larger potential is probably also in companion diagnostics. So once you go into the KI-67 and, and on all of those uh, mm -hmm. stainings, I think it becomes more important to do um, AI because it is more important to be precise. Um, I think it also, we've also heard a lot about efficiency gains when it comes to specialization generally. Um, so it allows you to, to give people that are more generalists a, a bit you know, faster edge by having a second opinion, so to say, that they have. That is a bit of an efficiency. And then, of course, there's a lot of tedious tasks um, that you have to do. 
in a pathology lab and uh, those are also easier and, and there, there you will probably have a very high efficiency gain and then there is I mean the standard evaluations where the efficiency gain is probably marginal so it yeah I think that's a good that's a good answer I, I don't know if I could do better I just know that the uh, the more time you spend on an algorithm like this the the more efficient you'll be in the in, in the future for you know making any any adjustments to the algorithm. It's better it's better to spend some time in the initial phase of setting it up, uh, and once you've got a model working, you can um, you could even supplement it with with classical uh, image analysis uh, algorithms for um, cleaning it up afterwards. So post processing and so on. You can really create a pipeline um, for an entire type of of analysis that you could just feed data into. Um, and that can save you uh, tons of time. It, it really depends on what you were doing before. Um, and yeah, anyways, I, I don't know if that's a good answer or not. But <laughs> I think it is, Alex. I think yours is better. But generally, yeah, the learning effect shouldn't be underestimated, right? Also, the algorithms will learn. So the efficiency that you can gain from them is going to increase over time. Um, then uh, yeah, there was a question whether you also allow for new feature training in your software. Um, new feature training. So, for example, in in histology evaluation, can you you know I mean you have shown now that you can do muscle and bone marrow and stroma and whatever. Mm -hmm. Can you do other tissue types? Can you? Uh, do yeah, I mean, it's it. It I, I showed um, a rat paw and human <laughs> human breast cancer. There's a huge difference there. I think um, so. It really, I mean, even if I even if I gave this algorithm honestly a picture of the street uh, and asked it to identify, you know, plants uh, or something, it would probably be able to do the same the same kind of classification here. It's it's really just a, uh, identifying. Pixels are the same type, and um, uh, you can be very, very particular about this. Uh, and and you can the amount of classes you can add here. I don't think we've found a limit to how many you can do. So far, I think the most I've done is seven classes, seven individual types of tissue, uh, uh, tissue classes within one image. Uh, other than that, I haven't found more more classes you can you can classify in tissue. I mean, you, I'm not a biologist, so there might be um, more that I'm not aware of, but I haven't found a practical use for more than seven up until now. Um, then, can you you've showed before that there is uh, ways to kind of evaluate how much area you have uh, of a certain tissue class? Can you also do percentage? Could you, for example, assess how much percent the tumor takes yeah. of the tissue? Yeah, totally. That's uh, that's just a that's just another step in the end, uh, which I, I haven't set that up for for percentages. I just did area measurements because I thought that would be interesting. But yeah, percentages. You would have a total total tissue area. You could set that up to combine um, all classes and then see what percentage each of those classes have of the total tissue area. So it's just a matter of setting up an algorithm to, um, or the at least the statistics in the end. Uh, so that's super simple. Perfect. To add that. Um, can you also quantify single cells after the tissue classification? Yeah, so that's a, that is the next step then. So combining uh, uh, a tissue classification with Single cell analysis is a uh, is a culmination of of both of the, the two most powerful types of tools that you have at your disposal in this software um, to see how many cells there are uh, part of each of these tissue classes, and that's probably the uh, I'll, I'll probably show that in the next in the next session where we combine the tissue classifier and the nuclear segmentation based on deep learning. Mm -hmm. Very good, very good. Um, we are actually slightly over time now, so uh, I'm not sure how we're doing with questions. Um, there, there would still be few, but uh, otherwise I think I can just urge everybody reach out to us. Uh, then we can actually take more time to discuss these questions. 
Yes. I think we will also pick them up and see if we can uh, fit them into um, in the next session as well, potentially. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. So, um, but I'm afraid that we have to wrap up um, because it's nearly 10 to, and, uh, you know, I'm sure, um, yeah, there's other things <laughs> that need to be done. Sure. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, um, with this, I will just, you know, repeat um, once more that uh, this was part one. Part two will be on Tuesday next week at the same time, however, slightly shorter. Um, again, using at the breast uh, cancer tissue and going into nuclear segmentation. Um, so we'll go <clears throat> a step further. Uh, I really will hope you can join us. And if you haven't uh, registered, you may do so. Just go to prissypoint.com slash um, webinar. Webinar, I can see there, but um, webinar. Um, and you'll, you'll get there. Um, right. And then uh, feel free to reach out to um, Birgit or Alex if you, you know, have um, questions you'd like them to, to pick up um, individually. And um, I think that would be it for today. Um, I thank you all our listeners and attendees for your attention. Um, and also, of course, Birgit and Alex for, um, you know, for presenting uh, on such a very exciting topic. Uh, before, um, what, after you close the meeting, please just take maybe 10 seconds, 15 seconds to answer our satisfaction survey. Uh, let us know how much you like this event. Um, and uh, we really look forward to um, having your feedback on this and um, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Bye, everyone. See you. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.